Russell Philip, and today we're gonna have a really special episode. We're gonna be talking to my friend Bart, and Bart's gonna be talking to us about his project called Reactor. And I'm really interested in Reactor because, from what I understand, Reactor has some roots in RX and reactive programming and some of those types of things, which I've had interest in. So mm -hmm. if you have as well, this should be a really cool um, episode for you to check out. So Bart, why don't you introduce, introduce yourself to everyone, let us know who you are and what do you do? Yeah. Hey. Hey, welcome, everyone. Uh, I'm Bart. I'm, I'm a developer here at Microsoft, and I've been at Microsoft for almost 14 years now. Um, I've worked in a bunch of different places uh, throughout my career, including .NET when I started back in 2007. Before that, I was an MVP for, for C Sharp when I was still in college. So, so I've kind of been with the .NET journey all the way since, um, I believe, the earliest betas um, in, in the early 2000s. So um, at Microsoft, I was on .NET Framework. I then moved into doing some technical incubations in the SQL Server group. And out of that came, came Reactive Extensions. Um, and then I went on to actually build this uh, distributed event processing system in um, the Bing organization, or I should say the extended Bing organization, where we do um, all sorts of online services for the company. Um, and so that was Project Reactor, the genesis of, of Project Reactor. And for the last couple of years, I'm kind of back from having been in a, in a product team and a service team um, since last year, I'm back in, in the incubation space. So I'm currently working on the next uh, secret project, So, uh, which we, we won't talk about today. But uh, so this is more like looking backwards at you know what we did with Reactor, how we actually took it to open source, and, and what the future looks like. No, I'm going to have to talk to you about that secret project when we come off stream, because I'm, I'm interested in that, the fact that you oh, said Oh, OK, secret. off stream, yes. <laughs> off stream, we'll talk about it. But yep. I know, you know, for some folks that may not know you, you know, you've had a history in tons of really influential products at Microsoft, particularly in the .NET space. And you, like you said, you've worked on reactive extensions. Mm -hmm. I believe you also worked on Link as well at some point. Um, yeah. You've also did some things with Windows Phone. So mm -hmm. I think you've been a part of that, you know, um, very high scale event driven space for a fair amount of time, like within your career. Is that correct? That's right. Yeah, I would say like, out of those 14 years, maybe at least eight years, maybe close to 10 years, we're in data processing and event processing systems. Um, it was kind of a continuation of what I did before I joined Microsoft. So yeah. prior to joining Microsoft, I was an MVP for C Sharp, as I mentioned before. And yeah. um, I, I did a lot of link providers, like link to Active Directory, link to SharePoint, something called the Meta Link Provider that could combine multiple link providers to do queries across different data sources, which has a tremendous amount of challenges. Um, and that actually, after being joined at Microsoft and spending some time in the WPF team, um, that's actually why I moved to Eric Meyer's team on the SQL Server group. Um, and he was one of the co-creators of Link. So we kind of took, you know, the passion I had in college back and, you know, kind of implanted it in uh, yes. in totally different streaming or like data processing paradigms like like event processing and yes. and the reason windows phone came up around that same time was you know we need to have ways to to represent sensor data on the phone so like how do we deal with um, changes to say your gps location or your you know notification center for you know getting those pop-ups and those type of things and so so that's kind of the tangent that that we went on for a while to kind of think about event processing on devices. And lo and behold, today, like it's all about devices, right? With IoT yeah. sensors and so on. So, so in some sense, I was kind of, you know, a bit ahead of its time um, or like maybe at the right time to uh, to look into these things. Um, yeah. Nice. So now, Bart, I know you have tons of stories, but before we get into the stories, yeah. uh, I want to just make sure that we take a moment and acknowledge our audience. I always mm -hmm. do this every show. Um, because you know our .NET audience is so vast, right? Like we have folks from all over the world that tune in and check us out every single week. And I just want to always make sure I share my appreciation for all of these folks. I'm looking in the chat now, and I'm seeing where everyone is coming in from. It's always mm -hmm. just so exciting. We have some folks here from Belarus. We have folks here from India, Poland, Sweden. We have some folks here from Saudi Arabia. I see. Uh, I see Brazil in here. I see Brazil in here a couple of times. Mm -hmm. um, there we go. We have some folks from Germany. 
Um, again, folks from all over the world. I can only imagine to how late at night it is. So again, oh, I yeah. appreciate you all staying up late to um, so make sure that you check this out. Um, here we go, New Zealand, Belgium. We have some folks ah, here from Belgium. New Jersey. <laughs> it's probably like the first one in the United States that we've gotten, that's funny. Um, and again, like tons of folks from all over the place, the UK. So definitely always appreciate you all coming in every week um, and being here for this, this, this show. Um, here we go, some folks from Finland and so on and so forth. So what I'm going to do before we dive in and, and listen to Bart tell some of the stories and obviously dive into some demos, I want to make sure that we take a look at some of the cool things that have been happening in the space of .NET over the past week or so. So I'm going to share my screen really quickly and let's take a look at some of these links. Oops, and I there we go. So the first link I want to share from you, um, this one is the .NET tools blog over at JetBrains and our buddy Phil Hack. Uh, actually has this really cool project called Abbott. And so this webinar, which happened um, a couple of days ago, um, he talks about how you can do chat ops, you know, what chat ops are, you know, how you can do it. And then I believe this project actually uses .NET, .NET Core, ASP.NET, and some other things as well. So if you're interested in chat ops and building bots and, you know, adding those types of things to your business and, and learning what some of those benefits are, I definitely recommend that you head over to uh, this blog post and make sure you check out this video. Um, something else I want to make sure that you all know about. So in .NET 6, there's going to be some level of support for HTTP 3. And so Sam here on the .NET blog has written a really uh, interesting blog post. We talks about like, you know, well, what is HTTP and, you know, why is it supporting important? And, you know, using HTTP across things like HTTP client, our gRPC support, you know, Kestrel, HTTP sys, and some of these types of things. Uh, so again, if you're interested in HTTP, maybe you don't know what HTTP is and you're kind of just interested to figure out, you know, what are some of the ways that it can benefit your applications? What does it mean in terms of performance and connectivity and those types of things? Definitely make sure you check out this blog post on the .NET blog. Next thing, um, maybe some of you may or may not have seen like the Windows announcement that happened this week, but if you are and you may be interested in checking out a Surface Duo 2, then Make sure you head over to this blog post as well. And this one talks about how you could start developing for the Surface Duo. So I personally don't have a Surface Duo. You know, maybe we could get some sponsorship, excuse <coughs> me, and someone could probably give us one. But if you do have a Surface Duo, or maybe interested in getting a Surface Duo too, and you want to know, well, what do I need to start writing code that works on this device? Um, again, definitely head over here, check out the blog post. It talks to you about how you can set up the Android emulator, you know, what are some of the SDKs you need and some of those type of things as well. And of course, as always, I'll make sure I drop these links inside of the chat. So if you didn't get a chance to you know, copy these links down or you don't remember the titles or anything like that, um, I'll definitely share them with you in a second. And last but not least, I feel like we've been talking about this almost like every week now, .NET Conf. .NET Conf is happening on November 9th through 11th, um, 46 days, 18 hours, 46 minutes away. And we're going to have tons of great sessions. Um, the CFP is closed. I think that closed on September 13th. But there's still tons of opportunity to get involved in .NET Conf. Um, you can go here and check out the agenda that's still being, you know, um, fleshed out a little bit. You know, you can click on the swag link and check out some of the cool swag, the virtual swag that's going to be available for that too. And you know, the big thing for .NET uh, Conf is that .NET 6 is going to launch. So a lot of those new things that we're expecting, like you know, minimal APIs and you know all the performance improvements, the new link operators and C Sharp 10, like all that's going to be available for us on November 9th, launching at .NET Conf. So definitely make sure you check it out. Go ahead and click save the date. And, you know, it's, again, it's online, it's free, it's virtual. So, and as always, like, they're going to be recorded. I know folks always ask, hey, is this going to be recorded or not? It will be recorded. You'll be able to watch it here on the .NET YouTube channel. So if you didn't get to see a session or something like that, then you can always come back and check it out later. Okay, now that's it for links. Now, this is the part of the show where I always say, this is no longer the Session Show. This is now the Bart Show, right? So now we're going to talk about Reactor. Um, Bart, why don't we start off with, like, give me, like, the elevator pitch. Tell me, yep. like, what is Reactor and, and what types of problems that it's trying to solve today that, you know, that were hard for us to solve before? Yep. Um, I think there's, there's a couple of ways to approach um, the elevator pitch. Um, one is if you already know, you know, Reactive extensions, you know, it's, uh, it's stateful. Like, you know, event processing tends to be stateful. Um, say that you're doing an average of temperature, 
over a one hour window and you're half halfway that hour you know there's obviously some sum and some count yeah. of temperatures that's kept in order to to be able to figure out the uh, average at the end of the hour right um so classic reactive extensions does not have a persistence model um so like when your app dies you know you lose all that computational state and you can restart the query obviously but you know it will have lost um the accumulation so far just as an example and so so reactor actually if you know classic rx reactor or one of the components of reactor provides this persistence capability um to do persistent event processing um, using a mechanism called checkpointing so that's one way you can kind of approach it but that's only zooming into a very small piece of it um, because the next problem is how do you deal with building distributed event processing systems? Um, meaning, what if you want to have, um, and I'll, I'll take a very concrete example, um, what if you want to have all the users of Windows uh, be able to, um, to monitor flight status, for example? Like they're going to take a flight um, and they want to get notifications when the flight changes. Or, you know, they want to get notifications when there's like, you know, bad weather coming up and they need to take an umbrella to leave the house in the morning. Um, so, so now you have like, tons of queries that you need to run and they may all be different um, unlike some analytics queries that are like you know very very similar and you have a few of them here you may have like literally billions of small queries each of which are different um, and they're tapping into big data sources like changes to weather information changes to the news maybe you know emails arriving in in your own mailbox um, tweets happening um, and so what we needed to do is also have the ability to have this stateful and reliable computation, but scale it out across a whole lot of machines and have a mechanism to actually submit these ad hoc queries, just like say you have a SQL database, you can send SQL queries to a remote SQL database and will execute it. Here you would wanna send a query to a remote event processing service um, and then just let that query run forever until you say like stop processing events now. Um, and so that's like, you know, the macroscopic picture of, of a reactor. Um, um, and one last thing maybe to, to actually point out as part of the, you know, lengthy elevator pitch is, uh, is that it's really a framework to build these systems. It's not like a turnkey solution, like you go to the Azure portal and you say, give me a new reactor. Um, that's something companies can build because we open source this to allow people to actually build these type of systems. Um, but it's really a set of, of components that you can compose equally well on very small systems. Like for example, just replace classic RX by this component so that you can actually have persistence of events if you care about that. Um, but you can equally well build systems that integrate in existing systems or like entire independent cloud scale services. And so, um, so we kind of you know built it as a set of framework components that can be composed to uh, to enable building these systems, which also means there's a lot of goodies in the stack that can be used in totally different places. Like we've had capabilities in here that deal with like uh, code generation and expression tree compilation and optimization. And these have been used in classic database products at Microsoft. Um, and so the byproducts, the sum of the value in the byproducts is often equally large, if not larger in certain cases than you know, the, the tip of the iceberg, like the kind of thing you want to enable in the first place. Um, and so this library framework centric approach has has pros and cons. Uh, one right. pro is it, it's incredibly pluggable. We've, we've built it, you know, to run in the Bing data centers, but it's run in Exchange mailboxes. It's run on Windows Phone, on Windows Desktop. It's um, even been squeezed into embedded devices, certain portions of this. Um, so that's, that's like, you know, one of the pros. The con, obviously, is that, that you have to compose those pieces and those building blocks to build an entire solution. Um, so, like, you you don't do file new project and upload to Azure, and there you have your distributed event processing system. Um, so you get a lot of flexibility. Um, but, you know, it, it's really meant to be catered towards a developer audience that likes to put things together, uh, as opposed to people who want to, like, you know, just have an online service. Okay, so then... So then what I'm hearing, uh, so I'm going to try and like rephrase it. Mm -hmm. So what I'm hearing is, let's say I have a problem and, you know, like I'm trying to build an intelligent app that's going to help me like make a decision 
based on like a collection of event streams. And mm -hmm. Like you said, my event streams might be, you know, the traffic that's happening and then the weather yep. attached to the traffic, right? Like those are two the separate streams of information. Mm -hmm. But in now I want to I want to ask the question, like I want to ask my app a question. What time should I leave for work? Yep. Right. Mm -hmm. So now I'm looking at the stream of data that's talking to me about the weather, you know, mm -hmm. the stream of data that's probably talking to me about the traffic and be like, yep. oh, it's going to start raining at two o'clock. But oh, at mm -hmm. you know, one thirty, there's going to be a lot of traffic. So like mm -hmm. there's this window of time that might be the most optimal one. So mm -hmm. from a from a queryability perspective, right, because when I think about Rx and Link and the lineage of where Reactor kind of comes from, it's a lineage of queryability, right? So now yep. I have these I have these streams and I can query and I can ask my app questions, right? Exactly. I could be like, what time should I go to work based on, you know, mm -hmm. some algorithm or some formula that I'm going to compose with these queries. Yep. But now what you're saying to me now, not only can we do those queries, but now we have that ability to do checkpointing, which is interesting. Mm -hmm. So now yep. if bad things happen, you know, internet cuts out, network connectivity, you know, transient errors, things of that nature, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? Whenever my app or you know my solution rehydrates itself i could just kind of continue right like exactly. i'm not going to lose all of the context that i had before it's yep. it will be persistent to a point and then we can kind of keep going right that's right yeah so actually we, we we do persist multiple multiple facets right like the the traditional way of thinking about like you know a dot nat app that has a link query inside of it is that the uh, the query expression is kind of burned into the app Right? Like, you know, you're right. compiling it and you end up with IL code and it happens to talk to system.link or system.reactive. And that's where the implementation of the query operators is. But every time the app starts, it's going to rebuild that query just because it goes through that code path. Um, so that's like the code itself. But then you also have like the data aspect, right? Like you have an operator like sum or aggregate or like combine latest in Rx. Um, and these contain states, like in the latest event seen, because they need to compare the next event to it, for example. Um, so, so that's the state in there. Um, Reactor actually captures both, because you don't want the queries also to be tied to the application. You may want uh, the application to be the thing that submits the query to some remote execution, um, for example, in the cloud or a different process or, or whatever it is. So we actually persist both the code definition, the expression tree that represents the intent of the user, like what the query looks like, right. as well as the runtime state of that query. Um, yeah. and so, so that's really, really one way of thinking about the two pieces that kind of change compared to classic, classic Rx. And in fact, the last thing we did in classic reactive extensions was enable query providers to be built for Rx. So you could write like link to Twitter, for example, where you would Right, something like from tweets and Twitter, where tweet contains hashtag, you know, Lady Gaga or something, select, yeah. you know, whatever, right? Um, yeah. So being able to take that query and, and, and send it to like a remote execution service as opposed to to your laptop, your poor laptop getting the whole Twitter fire hose of all the tweets in the world, you know, sent locally just to filter everything out. That's not about Lady Gaga. Um, so so that that's like you know the ability to transport the code and the ability to uh, to persist and recover the state that's associated with that running computation. Uh, mm -hmm. These are the two things. And and if you look, for example, at this this concrete scenario of of um, you know tell me when to leave to the airport, for example, or when to leave to go to my next meeting, these queries are um, in in the context of Cortana, which was one of the motivating reasons in the past to actually build Reactor. In the context of Cortana, at the moment you have a new appointment that's associated with a location, we actually start uploading that query to Reactor. Um, mm. And so like, if my calendar contains appointments for the next couple of months and they have locations associated with them, there's a dormant query sitting somewhere in oh. the cloud um, mm. that, that will not be forgotten, that, that's being checkpointed. Um, but it has operators in it that say like, well, don't don't start listening for traffic until a certain time. So it has something like, you know, traffic dot skip until, you know, one day before the meeting or something, or like you know, a couple of hours before the meeting, and then take until the time the meeting is over. So like, it's listening to all the traffic information, but it's already clipping it out to the time when the information will become relevant. Um, and so that's why we have billions of these queries 
sitting in, in cloud services is because they get submitted and it's kind of fire and forget, right? You know, the application created an appointment, sent it over and now trust this remote entity to uh, to monitor the traffic um, when time comes to, to make it to that meeting. Um, and then, you know, notify you, you have to leave now because traffic on a certain road is too bad. And if you don't leave now, you will be late. Um, right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I can imagine that there's some really interesting performance benefits that come from that because I'm not running the query at the moment I need it. I actually, it actually mm -hmm. starts before I even know I need it. You know what I mean? Like you're almost like preemptively generating the question. You mm -hmm. know what I mean? Yeah. Like you're, mm -hmm. you're making the assumption based on the context, right? The context in this case being meetings, right? Or yep. you know, calendar. What, time, mm -hmm. what time my meetings start? What does my calendar look like? Like mm -hmm. you're preemptively guessing. They're probably going to want to know this information. We're going to pre-populate portions of the query and then mm -hmm. later on as we get more information we continue to like build on top of that yep. until we get to the yep. point that they want to ask the question right mm -hmm. cortana this that or the other and then now mm -hmm. you're just like oh, okay we have like three quarters of it i can just kind of continue because again mm -hmm. it's been persisted over time and then i can yep. just keep going or they, they don't even have to ask the question right because it's a push-based system so like oh, yeah. the query in the first place can say notify me when to leave, you know, by sending a push notification to a device, right? Or doing something. Um, so it, it, it is computing a lot of state. Um, in some cases that state ends up in queryable stores. So people can ask questions about like, what's the current state of execution of this, this streaming, um, streaming query. Um, but in a lot of cases, it actually is push end to end, right? Like traffic information flows in, to a massive amount of queries on the left hand side and then on the right hand side some of those start triggering um you know push notifications or like insert things into tables um in response to the events that have happened right um so it's it's a very i mean it's reactive at its heart right so it's like you know push based sense. all the way through um yeah but but as you said like you know this this uh, populating things ahead of time and so on the, the interesting thing is, and, and that's what we found with, with Reactor, is um, you can often embed a query because of, of the nature of the query operators in reactive extensions, which is very expressive. You can often embed queries in bigger queries, right? So like now, if you want to say this entity in the system that's responsible to set up these time to leave queries, um, could that itself be a query that's listening to new appointments being created and appointments being canceled, right? Because then, then you know, like, you know, the meetings that are still on the calendar of the user are really, you know, a stateful computation of, um, of like receiving notifications of new meetings being scheduled and then listening to meetings being canceled, at which point you can cancel the inner queries. So it's almost like you're doing a join, right? Like you're doing a reactive join over calendar events and exchange and then you're doing a reactive join with with timers, you know, like to to join like exactly the time in which yeah. you need to be listening to traffic. And then you're doing a join with the traffic information within that time window. And so it's kind of like turtles all the way down um, in some sense. And of course, you can tap into as high as you want or as low as you want. Like you can have very simple queries. In fact, we had people use Reactor in production for very simple pub sub kind of scenarios like mm you know, have a huge amount of, of data coming in, do some filtering or grouping, and then send it to, to destination systems. Um, and then you have literally queries like this time to leave query that we've been talking about here that monitors traffic and all sorts of other things, um, which is actually a query that fits on one page, but it's like quite big because it contains right. maybe 20 operators, right? Like, uh, like um, skipping in time, listening yeah. in time, joining streams, filtering, projections you know aggregates like the whole shebang is in there <laughs> right so we got a couple questions coming in from youtube that i want us to get to mm -hmm. <clears throat> so this one's person's asking uh, how is reactor different from things like spark structured streaming kafka mm -hmm. or event hub yeah yeah so like this the aspect of of the uh, the data acquisition right like the way that you get the events into the system and then there's the aspect of, you know, the expressiveness. How do you express your, your queries, right? And how easy it is it to submit ad hoc queries to the system. And so in the latter case, like, you know, there's where we totally bank on the expressiveness of, of link and, you know, the, the, the query operators that people are familiar with in, um, 
in .NET languages, for example, or even in TypeScript and JavaScript, right? Like this very simple, you know, fluent interface pattern of like composing query operators. When it comes to the data acquisition, um, Reactor doesn't really have an opinion. Um, what that means is when you receive Reactor, it doesn't have built-in capabilities to receive events from Kafka or Event Hub or Service Bus or CRMQ or any any kind of streaming system. Um, these are the plugins that you build. And so it's it's effectively the same as Classic Rx, right? Classic Rx doesn't come with data sources. Um, like, I mean, it, it has ways to receive events from .NET, like, you know, .NET events, but it doesn't have a way to, for example, receive events from file system watchers. Um, right. You would actually build an observable that takes in the path to the to the directory to monitor and then say raise events whenever something happens there. Um, and that's the same in Reactor. Like it doesn't come with sources, it doesn't come with syncs. But if you look in like for example the way we've, we've used it in Bing, we had sources for um, Event Hub, CRMQ at some point, Azure Service Bus, and we had syncs for um, databases like Cosmos DB um, event stream systems themselves, like other event hubs that other systems listen to. Um, and so it, it's this pluggability. So um, that, that's one of the, the key differences there. Okay, so I know, so we're at about halfway and we have more questions coming in, mm -hmm. but I think this would be a good point if we can maybe show like some really small demos, maybe some yep. introductory demos on how do I get started with, with Sounds good. like what does some of the code look like? So can we yep. switch over to your screen really quickly and mm -hmm. maybe just you know take a look at some of those? And then as yep. we keep going, like we'll look at um we'll look at we'll, we'll look at answering some more questions as well. Sounds good. Yeah. Let me know when you can see the screen. Okay. All right, your screen is on. So we're looking at yep. GitHub right now. That's the GitHub website here, uh, where Reactor is is uh, open source. Um so and if you take a look at the at the top here, um, I just want to point that out. There's really three pillars to the system. There's this thing called Nucleon, which is kind of the heart of the system, um, a whole set of utilities that, that can be used outside the context of event processing. Then we have this thing called Reactive, which is the evolution of classic reactive extensions, but that provides support for, for checkpointing and state persistence. And then you have a reactor, which is this the system built on top of that, that enables you to build scalable distributed event processing systems. Um, so those are the three layers of the cake. And you can actually, you know, plug into any of these or like, you know, tune into any of these. So for example, in Nucleon, if you just would like to, uh, to do things with expression trees, because, you know, you may want to serialize expression trees and, and send them over to a different system, you can actually use bonsai serialization is the thing we call here. But if you want to do an optimization of, of expression trees, which is used at the core of the query optimizer in, in the reactor, you can just use that piece. So it's a very fine-grained uh, structure. And, and there's other things in there as well. In Reactive, you will actually find the classic, you know, Reactive world, like, you know, link operators, interfaces, some schedulers. It should look very familiar to people who've used classic Rx. You know, this is the, you know, equivalent to classic Rx, but with those additional capabilities layered on top of it. Um, and so that's uh, that's this piece. And then Reactor itself, um, that's the piece that I will be, will be demonstrating here. And this contains this whole um, set of capabilities to actually build what we call a reliable query engine, and then have the ability to submit queries to that um, and to plug into external event, um, event streaming systems to receive events and submit events. Um, to the inside, uh, to the outside world. So, so that's kind of the top level structure. And so what I've done literally before, you know, we came onto the show, I did git clone of this thing. I then did .NET build of the whole thing. And then I opened um, this whole repo in, um, in Visual Studio Code. And the reason I did that is because we've actually banked very heavily on um, interactive notebooks with .NET Interactive to, um, to make things actually easy to demonstrate. And so if you go to all of these uh, these folders next to every single library, we do have a notebook that demonstrates, you know, just that library. So like if you want to want to know how to um, serialize expression trees, you could open the notebook um, for expression tree serialization. If you want to see how to do stateful Rx, nothing more, nothing less, you could open the notebook in the reactive folder and actually see 
That's how I write the query. That's how I persist it. Um, what I'm doing here is I'm actually going all the way to the tip of the iceberg, right? Like I'm going all the way to the top, um, a notebook that demonstrates using Reactor for IoT scenarios. And so when you build the whole thing, you can actually just literally go to the notebook here um, and, and execute all of these different cells. And if you want to learn about how the thing works internally, you could actually also hit this cell over here to do debugger.launch. And then in Visual Studio, you could set breakpoints all over the source code. It's all open source to kind of step through like all, all the layers of, of the stack, right? Um, I'm not going to do that right here, but I'm, I'm just going to um, you know, step through this demo here and I'll explain as I'm going uh, what's actually going on. But here's actually the gist of it. This is the heart of a reactor, really. Uh, so what's happening here is that in order to host these query expressions, um, and, and to make them persistent, including both the expressions and their state, you need to have this notion of a query engine. And so this is a little helper that actually composes a bunch of facilities that come in this framework um, into a minimal kind of you know, hosting environment in which you can run queries. And so what I'm doing here is I'm actually just you know, gonna persist those queries to some in-memory key value store. But in reality, that may be you know, backed by the file system, maybe backed by a replicated state store, maybe backed by Cosmos DB. Like you can implement key value stores for wherever you want to persist the state of your queries. Um, and so here I'm just going to instantiate one of those query engines. And then you see over here two operations in addition to using that engine. The first thing that we do here is, is recover the engine from existing state. Then we're going to use the engine, for example, to formulate new query expressions that need to be persisted and executed. And then at the end, I'm going to checkpoint the query engine. Now, often this doesn't happen you know, at the end. Often this happens on a timer periodically, right? You would be checkpointing the state of all the computations every minute or so. Um, and then at the end, you know, we're unloading it. So this is a gray school shutdown. In, in the case of, for example, um, Reactor being hosted in the Bing data centers, um, this unload, this graceful unload almost never happens because the reason that the machine goes down is because the machine is being rebooted to install updates, for example. So, you know, it just, the process gets terminated. Instead, what happens is like we, we just call this checkpoint async every five minutes or so um, to be able to persist the state of, of the running computations. Um, and then, of course, like when we come back up, we will recover from that state and we'll actually ask to replay the events that we missed. So we can actually get back to the place where we were before uh, the cache happened. Um, so that, that's that. Um, and so what I'm going to do here is I'm just going to use that little helper that I created higher up to actually just create an engine. It will recover, but there's nothing to recover. Um, we're not going to do anything with the engine, and then it's going to persist itself and shut down. Um, so this is like the way I'm kind of demonstrating using that core facility. And so what's happening now is that I actually have, you know, on disk, a little um, state store that contains the state of my query engine. And today, like as you can see, it only contains two kilobytes of data structures because, well, there's nothing in it. Like it, it's an empty, blank new engine. Um, and there's a couple of like, you know, entries in there just for, for bookkeeping purposes. So it, it, it's completely empty. And so then what we can do is we can actually define um, entities within that query engine. And that's often something that's done one time, you know, when the system gets deployed. Um, so for example, the traditional reactive system does have capabilities to, um, to do filtering and projections, you know, all the classic Rx operators. I and mean, they're not built into the engine. It's a very pluggable system. Um, so for example, some deployments do have all those standard query operators but then also have custom query operators that do things like machine learning, for example. Um, so you can actually add these you know, as you go. Um, and so when, when you have a query engine, it's completely empty. It doesn't know anything. It doesn't know how to receive events, how to submit events. It doesn't know how to filter, to project. You have to deploy all those little entities in, into the engine. So it's a very um, compositional system. And this is actually very similar to to downloading system.reactive but not importing the, the system.reactive.link namespace. Like, you know, then you don't have query operators. You just have observables and observer interfaces uh, to receive events and to send events, but nothing to manipulate these. 
So here I have defined uh, two operators, like something that will print to the console and something that's a very simple timer. And so the query engine has persisted again in the previous cell, and it has actually now, as you can see, four kilobytes of state. And that additional two kilobytes is actually the expression trees that represent you know, this, this logic to print to the console and this logic to run a timer. So that's now stored in the engine. I can refer to these query operators or those capabilities in, in subsequent queries. So that's all the preparation aspect. And that typically only happens once at deployment of the system. But here's like, you know, what the code looks like for somebody submitting queries to that engine now. What I can do is I can actually walk up to this engine and say, give me one of those timers you have there and give me one of those console observers that you have there. And now I want to put these things together. So in classic Rx, what you would be doing is you would be doing observable.timer and you would be doing, you know, new console observer. And then you want to put these two things together by doing subscribe in between the two of them. So what's happening here instead is very much like link to SQL and entity framework. You're not getting the real objects. Instead, you're getting proxies to those objects running in that remote engine, which could be on my same machine, but could be across the globe as well. And so here I'm getting my proxy to my timer observable, my proxy to my console observer to print. And then I smash those two things together over here using, you know, creating the timer that will fire every second and subscribing the console to that. And then instead of doing subscribe in classic Rx, what I'm doing is subscribe async. And what's happening here is that this whole query expression that I formulated on this line over here gets uploaded into that engine, which may be on the same machine, maybe across the globe, doesn't matter. Um, and it will be associated with a certain name. So I can go back to that subscription later and, for example, delete it. And so at that point, my application can go away. I've instantiated that query and it's going to sit in a remote system um, and it's going to run there until I say stop running it. So as you can see over here, and this is all because I'm doing console.write line, it's all in a single notebook. Um, you can see that indeed my timer is running for five seconds. Um, but it's only running for five seconds because I'm shutting down my query engine locally. And what's happening when I shut down the query engine is that it's persisting all the state. So if I now go to the next cell over here and I recover the query engine, you see my timer comes back alive and is, is still ticking, as you can see. Um, so this simulates a checkpoint and a recovery. The system went down in the cloud. It came back up on a different uh, different machine. It rehydrated the state from the state store, and you know the client is long gone. You know has submitted the query potentially days ago or months ago, and you know the query comes back to life and, and starts executing again. And then obviously the client could come back at some point and say, "Hey, you know I gave you this subscription earlier with this name over here, this heartbeat subscription." I would like to get rid of it. And in classic Rx, you would just call dispose. In this case, because this goes to a remote system, it's dispose async. And so you see now, I actually walk up to that query. It's running for five more seconds. That's what I'm doing here. And then my client comes around and actually disposes the subscription and it stops running, All right. And now if the query engine would be recovered from state again, it would no longer start that subscription. It's been deleted. Um, and so that's kind of the top level, top level um, view of, of what the system looks like using a very simple query in the middle. Um, and then obviously we can, you know, go into writing more sophisticated queries. But the key essence of this whole thing is once you've set up a system that hosts a query, a query engine, this thing here, this line where I'm doing timer dot subscribe, can literally be any Rx query. So it could be timer with where and select and group by and window and aggregate and sum and count and all that kind of stuff. Like all the Rx queries are supported, um, but the difference is that you can submit them to this remote uh, query engine that does reliable execution with checkpointing support. So you've mentioned Rx, particularly you've said classic Rx a few times. And so yep. I think I want to kind of paint a picture of what the world kind of looks like. So. Yep. Is it, can we look at Reactor as something that we could look, that we could use alongside Rx? Mm -hmm. I think 
current version of Rx is like Rx three or four, whatever the yep. current version is, mm -hmm. or is it something that's like a replacement for Rx? Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Like I'm trying to figure yeah. out like are are the do the query operators have the same mm -hmm. interfaces? Are they the same? Are they the same observables? Are they you know, yep. I know there is mm -hmm. a, a IQ observable and IQ yep. async observable and those types of mm -hmm. things. Or is yep. this something that's, that's like standalone all by itself? Yeah, that's a very, very good question indeed. Like, you know, early on during the design of this, I, I was kind of in the camp of, you know, we can potentially replace a classic Rx using using this mechanism and, and kind of bring in this optional checkpointing support. Um, there's a number of technical reasons why why there's some complexity involved in, in doing that, um, but we can get darn close. Now, one thing that's that I want to point out here is that the life cycle of a subscription in, in Reactor is much more fine-grained than you have in Classic Rx. So in Classic Rx, you have an observable, an observer, and you do subscribe and things start happening. Now, in a core query engine, you kind of need to have more phasing because when you do subscribe, you're effectively just composing a source of events with a destination for events. Like you're kind of gluing things together, right? You're building a data flow system effectively, um, an event processing, you know, um, computation. Um, you don't want to have that computation kick off immediately if in between you would like to restore the state that you remembered from a previous time you were executing that computation, right? So we need to separate composing the query from launching the query. And similarly, when the query is running, we need to have a mechanism to walk up to that query and say, persist your state and then continue executing. And so what's really happening here is that when you look at the interfaces in, in, in Reactive over here, this uh, layer of the stack, um, we actually have interfaces that are very similar to the ones you have in classic um, in classic Rx, the difference being that um, they actually support much more fine-grained operations over um, the life cycle of these uh, these query expressions. And so you see that the I subscribable is a layer on top of the classic Rx I observable, but the difference is that it has this notion of an I subscription, which is a handle to that computation that can be used to checkpoint restore, start, stop, pause, resume, like all sorts of operations can be applied to the entire execution graph um, in order to, to facilitate these things. And so if you don't need any of those persistence mechanisms and you're just doing volatile event processing, for example, in the UI framework or something like that, you don't need like these multiple phases that have been added to the life cycle of a subscription. And so it's, it's kind of, overhead, right? Like, you know, it's it's not very ergonomic for a user to have all these additional steps to take. Um, but these are the steps that the query engine needs. So, so long story short, what's really happening is that these are two worlds that are actually sharing the same query language, but they have different aspects to the implementation, right? Like the classic Rx is really about, you know, just write a query, 99% of the case, it just runs locally. We don't use all this expression tree stuff. And the moment you do subscribe, it needs to start executing. A very simple, you know, um, step up from classic.NET events with like, you know, this declarative language on top of it. Um, if on the other hand, you need to have all of this fine-grained control um, to make those queries kind of manageable um, by, by some bigger system like a query engine, then you kind of go down this path of, of reactive with a queue, um, which provides the same query language with the same semantics, but the implementations of the query operators are quite different because now they need to think about, you know, somebody may walk up to me and ask me to persist my state. Like, how do we persist that state and recover it? And for simple query operators, that would be easy to do, but for complex query operators like group by and select many, the implementation compared to classic Rx is completely different um, because, you know, catering for Making all the state explicit is is, uh, is not not so easy. So I'm, I'm guessing if I was a person that was already familiar with Rx and I'm using mm -hmm. it across my solution to do whatever, mm -hmm. even though there are some things that would be different, I'm assuming mm -hmm. it should be still a very familiar mindset, at yeah. least in the way that I think about composing my application. Exactly. The difference is being where, like you said, like the separation between 
the composition of the query and the execution mm -hmm. of the query. Exactly. And, you know, like the, the, you know, the implementation details of that. But other than that, hey, I know how Rx works. Mm -hmm. So this yep. is a familiar place for me to come in. And then now mm -hmm. I get the additional benefit of checkpointing and some of these other yep. things, right? The serialization yes, and all yep. those type of things. At the moment you get to the point of formulating your query, you're in the complete comfort zone of everything you know with classic Rx and Link. Like, you know, in this little bubble over here, there's a whole environment surrounding this that makes this query reliable, persistent, can send it across machines and cloud environments or whatever it is that's backing this particular query engine implementation. But, you know, within this little bubble over here, you know, it's all familiar. And if you would like to do exactly that in an application, the way you would be formulating your query is using the same query operators. They have the same names, the same parameters, just the hoops that you will have to go through to activate the query are slightly longer than with classic Rx. So you would be okay. doing subscribe and then you would be walking up to that subscription handle and effectively you have to ask it to start. <laughs> and okay. if you want to tear down your query, you would walk up to that handle and ask it to stop and then dispose the whole thing. So it's, it's just, you know, more steps to activate it after it's been formulated. And that enables us to insert these additional, um, additional steps, right? Yeah. Okay. So one part that I definitely wanted to make sure that we touched on a little bit was when you showed the GitHub repo, you mentioned that mm -hmm. the project is essentially broken up into three different pieces, right? So like, so yep. there's reactor, reactive, and then there's the nuclean part. And I was mm -hmm. looking in the chat and a few folks were talking about nuclean and, you know, how mm -hmm. amazing it is for them to see like the usage of, you know, um, the query tree, the, the uh, expression trees and things yep. of that nature. My, my question to you is, you know, since it's, broken up into these three separate pieces how easy is it for me to just use the part that i need right if i only yeah. need like the query tree expression i believe there's mm -hmm. some um adjacent serialization and some other things that are inside of there mm -hmm. as well like how yeah. is it easy how easy is it or you know how you know how much does it make sense for me to pull in some of those pieces and apply mm -hmm. them to like some other spaces like you know yep. i don't know maybe i want to maybe i want to use the json serialization or mm -hmm. maybe i want to you know, um, I don't know, serialize my SQL expression and send it over to another machine and execute it on a different box. Like, are some of those some of the things that we could do? Yeah. Yeah, it's actually, it's incredibly easy. Um, like, every single project that you see in the tree over here corresponds to a NuGet package. Um, from, like, you know, if you want to have the tip of the iceberg, there are some meta packages that contain the whole world, right? Mm -hmm. um, like, you know, everything you need to build a reactor client, everything you need to build to... Re to build a reactor service. These are kind of the top level packages, but they're really just composed out of very small packages. So um, for example, the, the one I pulled up on my screen here on, on, on GitHub is the expression tree optimizer library. And in fact, the, the genesis of this one predates classic, um, not classic, uh, predates reactor itself, because at some point we were working on distributed uh, graph database and we needed to have expression tree optimization capabilities. Uh, to optimize queries. So we built this um, this thing and then later we used it in, in Reactor and now we've used Reactor as the um, the shipping vehicle for, for this particular component. Um, and so yeah, if you just wanna do like expression tree optimization, you can literally right click at reference, search for this nucleon.link.expressions.optimizers um, NuGet package and, and you would be, would be off going and again, like with many of these things, you know, they come with a notebook. So like there's a notebook here that actually shows, assume that you did right click at reference for just this package. And you see over here, like it even, you don't even have to build the code locally. You can just go to the notebook and actually download, you know, the package through NuGet over here. It shows like, well, here's the hello world. How do you get going? Like, you know, you create these things, you create an optimizer. You have an expression here that does one plus one. It will print, you know, one plus two over here. I run it through the optimizer and the expression has been reduced to a constant expression of three. Like, like three cells in, you actually see without installing anything else, how would you use the expression optimizer um, in the simplest possible scenario? And here you go. Um, and so we do that for pretty much all of the libraries that come in this repo. Um, yeah. Okay, that makes sense. So if I was supposed to come over to the repo, um, mm -hmm. You have like these notebooks that are here. So this is this is pretty much like living documentation, right? I could come yep. in and I could kind of 
experiment with these. I could clone it to my local machine and I could experiment with those um, with those operators to kind of get an understanding of how those things work. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Now, I know, um, so you mentioned earlier that Reactor and Stash Reactive is open source, right? So folks mm -hmm. can go over to the GitHub organization. Um, they can start to get involved. Uh, I'm sure there's chat rooms and discussions are open and all, all, all kinds of ways to like interact with folks. Yep. What are, what is, what does the future of this project kind of look like? Like what yep. are some of the things that you're looking at in the future? Mm -hmm. um, you know, are you trying to put these in, you know, interesting places and scenarios? Mm -hmm. are, are there services and, you know, other products that are going to be built around it? Like what do we kind of, yep. you know, what can mm -hmm. we expect to see like going forward with Reactive? Yeah, exactly. Um, well, so as I, as I mentioned before, there's like the core, you know, uh, tip of the iceberg, which is the entire reactor and the byproducts. Um, so the first thing, of course, is like we want to keep the structure very fine grained and make sure that all the individual pieces um, do have value. So like, you know, things like everything in nuclear and everything in reactive, um, all these pieces can be used by themselves. And so we will continue supporting um, and, and improving these pieces. And when it comes to like taking the entire reactor stack and hosting it, that's actually where we um, work together very intensively with uh, the folks at engine.com who, um, who are .NET Foundation partners. Um, and in fact, you know, the, the sole reason that this has become open source is because of, of uh, their involvement. Um, so we actually had built this, uh, this set of technologies internally here at Microsoft. And um, we always had the idea like at some point, we can definitely open source a lot of these things, but it, it would be great to have uh, some people in the community that actually want to build a ground up solution using this. Like for example, in Azure, using the latest state of the art technologies, um, built like you know, a reactor service to which you can upload um, query expressions. And so what we did in the Bing team um, was actually often using infrastructure that we have available um, already that's kind of like, you know, um, private to Microsoft or like that's kind of, you know, in so certain cases, um, quite, quite ancient. Um, but we always want to separate, you know, the, the heart of the system from the way it's hosted in, in like a bigger environment. And so that's the sole reason that we're now able to actually push this out and, and, and show people. And I've actually worked with the, the folks at Engine to build like adapters to say event hub, event grid, service bus, um, all of these assets that, that exist today in, in public Azure. Um, and when we started, you know, in the Bing team, we didn't even have any of these things. We, we started this long before a lot of, of assets existed in, in, in Azure, but the system is very pluggable. So, so people can build these adapters. Um, and so that's, that's really where we're kind of headed. It's like we have this heart of the system as an open source set of libraries. Um, it's not like you clone the repo and it's asking you to install all sorts of, you know, transport frameworks and, and things that, that, you know, would represent specific choices that we made. Um, this thing doesn't make choices. And then a repo on top of it can actually leverage it to build out a concrete solution um, that's end-to-end, -end, that's turnkey. And that's, for example, like, you know, an Azure service or a service on a different cloud for that matter. Like, we're totally, totally happy. Um, happy supporting any usage. Um, and so at the heart of the system, there's there's a number of things that uh, that we'll be looking at going forward. Um, like, you know, better support for async, for example, um, is something that that we could do. Um, the core query operators being able to use async um, turns out to be not too much of a limitation um, in, in the context of event processing, but in certain cases, you would want to have that additional expressiveness there. Um, so th there's a number of things that, that we'll be looking at, but uh, the core of this system is actually incredibly stable. It's been in production for, um, yeah, the earliest yeah, deployments, yes. maybe close to a decade. Um, oh, wow. Yeah. Whoa. Mm -hmm. Okay. That's good to know. Um, so if people want to get involved, like what would you say is like the best thing mm -hmm. or the best, the best avenue for them to kind of get started? Um, yeah. I know there's the website. Um, are there docs that are available, like just getting started docs and yep. mm -hmm. you know, other than the Git repo? Yeah, so we have the GitHub repo. Uh, then we have, you know, the reactive.net website where um, we have a couple of, of um, you know, we have a, a whole demo section over here, an API section, and a documentation section. Um, there's also some blogs that are being written and, and will be 
be adding more to these and something that maybe is very interesting to people to kind of see like why did we build this and and you know how did it kind of evolve is this little ebook that we have here called a little history of reactor which has been downloaded a couple i think it's over five thousand times now um and and so like a lot of people have have really enjoyed like seeing what the what the history of reactor looks like and how we we got to where we are today so i would also recommend that because it it gives kind of a background into um, how all these these concepts came to uh, came to be, um, but really the, the the best course of action if you're a hands on hands on person is like to clone the repo and actually browse those notebooks and actually walk through them cell by cell. Um, and some of them are very you know simple and straightforward. Some of them show more sophisticated ways of putting the system together. Um, so you kind of have this entire dial of like beginner, advanced, and, and intermediate. Um, um, and yeah, literally you can just clone the repo, uh, go to your Visual Studio command prompt and do .NET build, um, and you will actually have it built for all the platforms that we support, and, and you can straight go into the notebooks um, to uh, to play around with it. Yeah. Awesome, sounds great. And then like you also mentioned, um, there's the folks that are at um, Engine that are supporting mm -hmm. this as well. It looks like there's like a little Slack icon. Is that what yep. that is? Like yep. next to the GitHub repo? That's so right, yeah. So if folks mm -hmm. are interested in going into that, um, they could do that as well. Yeah, um, they can go there, talk to us, yeah. Mm -hmm. So just really quickly, a couple comments from YouTube. So this person is saying, uh, so for me, my use case was building a custom query provider. The Nuclean mm -hmm. library has some built-in ways of implementing caches of compiled expressions and yep. comparators. So it sounds like, you know, some folks are already familiar with it and using it, which is which is always definitely really good to see. Yep. Um, I yeah, saw that's some actually, other... yeah, that's actually a pretty interesting uh, thing that came out of the high density requirement because we kind of ended up with, uh, you know, millions of queries being hosted in individual processes. And, you know, sometimes 80% of these queries are exactly the same, but they have different, you know, uh, constants in them, like, you know, yeah. notify me when the temperature is larger than 75 and somebody else wants it to be 73 or something sure. so so there's a lot of techniques that that have emerged in in these libraries to actually deal with um supporting a high number of these queries running concurrently in a system and so this compiled um expression tree cache is one of those examples yeah. mm -hmm. which is a byproduct that's useful by itself right of course so, so for all of you that are still here watching with us, um, definitely make sure you go ahead and check out the Reactor website. Um, head over, like Bart said, check out the GitHub repo and clone it. Okay, try it mm -hmm. out on your own machine and just kind of see what it feels like. Explore those notebooks. Um, again, and it is open source, so feel free to go ahead and submit issues. Um, mm -hmm. If you're interested in helping to write docs, I'm sure they'll appreciate some help with that as mm -hmm. well, just like yeah. every, every open source project does. And mm -hmm. if you'd like to see more about Reactor, maybe if we can have the engine folks come on, or if you'd like to mm -hmm. learn more about the different operators or see a little bit more hands-on coding, what it actually feels like to use the project, like either together or in their like, you know, separate pieces, definitely mm -hmm. let us know. Go ahead and leave a comment in the chat or at the bottom of the video. And if there's enough interest, we can definitely look forward to adding some more content. But with that yep. being said, um, that's going to be it. That's the end of the show. Mm -hmm. So we look forward to seeing all of you next week. Um, again, we have another on.net live. Um, Bart, thank you so much. I appreciate you, yep. you know, spending your time to come in and, and show us and talk to us about this. And um, I appreciate all of you that are still here and watching. Thank you so much. This has been another episode of on.net. Have a good weekend. Have a you know good rest of your day. Take care. And uh, we'll see you next time. Bye, everybody. Thank you.